Great. Uh, before we start today's seminar, I'll just mention the uh, next two weeks seminar. So this is a weekly seminar series and we'll carry on next term as well. Uh, as if any of you have great ideas or visitors, whether online fully or people who are coming through the UK who might be here, just feel free to suggest them to me. Next week, we've got uh, the, the next two are fully online. This is an uh, uh, experimental hybrid one. Next week, we've got Forrest Fleischmann uh, talking about forest restoration and nature-based uh, solutions frequently fail because they're not grounded in social science. And that's, been, that's a joint seminar with the Oxford India Center for Sustainable Development, uh, looking at the evidence base around why restoration fails or succeeds and what, what the context is. And the week after, we've got Plinio Sist from CIRAD in France on is forest management really a tool for the conservation of tropical forests, a forest ecologist perspective. And we're developing a, a, a range of interesting speakers for, for, for next term as well, when these will carry on. And if you're not on our mailing list, email Jane Applegarth. She'll drop her email in the chat, but anybody else who hasn't got it here can just talk to me and uh, we can add you to, to our weekly uh, mailing list. So handing over to our speaker today, our guinea pig for this hybrid event, it gives you great pleasure to, to welcome Jeff Harley, who is a, a, a professor of uh, in anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he's here in Oxford for a whole year uh, on a sabbatical uh, both at the School of Geography and the Environment and the Latin American Studies Center. And it's great to have you here, Jeff, uh, and, uh, uh, and I look forward to your talks. So, welcome. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. It's uh, This is the first time I've given a public talk in a couple of years now, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited um, and happy that those of you who can't join us in person are able to um, follow along online. I'd like to thank you, Yad Vinder, for um, setting up this talk and for being a, a great colleague so far since I've been here. It's been, I've enjoyed talking with you a great deal and learning from you. Um, and thank you to Jane, who's watching remotely for her help as well, Jane Applegar. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, so, Today, I want to talk about basically my anthropological research on a, on a frontier in the Amazon, places you might have seen from way up above, such as in that far remote sensing image, what it's like on the ground, how that vegetation, how that nature is sort of understood by the people inhabiting and transforming those spaces. I'm especially interested to speak with you all today because there's such a, a broad range of great people working on forests, environments, different different elements, the natural sciences, the social sciences, different different parts of this same issue. I think we have a shared goal, but we often go at it in different ways. So um, this is a an attempt to sort of contribute to what many of you are trying to do or trying to understand. So I welcome your um, sort of critical engagement with this. How can it be better? How can it better maybe perhaps connect? What are you not understanding? Or, how, how just hopefully we can have a conversation afterwards or during the Q&A more, but it's intended in that in that spirit of trying to work together. So you may have, you've, you've probably heard you might have just looked out the window right now at the at the protest uh, continuing from uh, from COP, which was which recently occurred. But deforestation has been in the news quite a bit with pledges to end deforestation, um, really making headlines. So. We, Really, what is deforestation uh, besides something terrible, something to be stopped? The Amazon, besides a place to be saved, something where people in California, where I live, come up to you on the street and say, do you want to help save the rainforest? Do you want to save the Amazon? Who's going to say no to that? It's a, it's a clearly, it's a moral issue uh, that is related to the future of humankind. It's important. So how do you then go in and attempt to understand the reasons that people do something that is so vilified? That's what I'm sort of trying to do here, but I'm going to break deforestation, sort of build back up to what this is from our sort of assumptions. In very technical terms, it's in Amazonian deforestation is cutting down the forest, removing the forest, often burning the forest to release uh, the biomass, the nutrients, to then replace that with cultivated crops from pasture, soy, uh, pasture, soy, large scale, often uh, to smaller scale, swid and agriculture, uh, where I work in the state of Acre, that's often manioc um, and, and corn and other, 
other crops of, of that nature. Ecologically, it's really a transition from a biodiverse uh, system to one that is quite simplified and controlled, and which, as I'll show today, is quite actively defended against the return of that biodiverse system as part of this sort of settler mentality. Um, so what drives deforestation, as we sort of understand it, broadly speaking, often there's a focus on international markets, fueling sort of demand for beef, soy, and these sorts of things, which certainly has a huge influence on what occurs in the Amazon. Uh, it's, we also see policies uh, on a national level um, having a great impact, often inadvertently through things like credit or the building of roads. Um, these structures make it so that this thing that, that is clearly um, not in everyone's best interest makes sense. It's, it, there's a logic to it, but if you're on the ground in the Amazon trying to figure out how to use your land, and that logic has become even more sort of pronounced in favor of, of transformation with the election of Bolsonaro, um, with you know enforcing an area this enormous uh, and difficult to access has always been a challenge, but these with sort of the gutting of, of, of key institutions and the undermining of public support. Um, this, this calculus of will I get in trouble for this deforestation or not is, has shifted to probably not. Um, so we know the structures, the context, who are the people that are engaging in this? If we sort of scale down, we begin to see they come into focus. Um, and then thinking about people in general in relation to structures. Uh, people often follow the structures. They do what is in general predicted, but they also in some famous examples in recent elections that I'm particularly aware of and other things related to my country, people also defy expectations in completely unpredictable ways, despite all sorts of surveillance and other and, and sort of in polls and all sorts of methods deployed to try to understand what people are going to do. There's still people behave in unpredictable ways. They can't be explained by economic rationality or policies. They can't, you have to understand this invisible thing that's often in land system science, uh, understood as the black box of sort of decision-making and behavior, which is culture. Culture is very difficult um, to kind of, to get at because it is integrated with the environment, it's integrated with economy, it's integrated with, with so many different things, it's difficult to sort of parse out in the same way. And it doesn't have the same weight and legacy of economic factors, for example. Um, but if you ever look, read about indigenous populations in the Amazon, for example, you'll see culture is very explanatory and very often used, sometimes in an in a, in a overly simplistic way. But um, when you we talk about people migrating to the Amazon and cutting down the forest, the culture is never a part of it. They're just, they're just responding to structures. So how do we kind of bring culture into this explanation? That's what I'm trying to, to, to do here. But given how complex a test that is, today I'm really just trying to start at a very fundamental level of the way people understand and categorize the part of the world that surrounds them, specifically plants, vegetation, and, and using that kind of as a way of understanding uh, their actions, the, 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 the mindset that essentially guides their activities. So uh, this, uh, this presentation essentially is focusing on this what a taxonomic system, a full taxonomy for those of you who are more in, in the realm of formal botany. These are just general ways that people classify the world that surrounds them. They could be plants, they could be people, they could be foods. They, um, and, and it's just based on some similar attribute that people um, find to be. Uh, for example, since I moved here, I've learned about this. I would walk around and I'd be like, wow, my hands are burning. And, it's, and I, I would touch these plants that I wouldn't know. And then maybe it was even you, Yadvin, you told me about seeing nettle. And now, I, now, so now I see this plant and I'm like, that goes in the dangerous uh, uh, avoid sort of category. Whereas before I was like, I'm in England. It's just landscape shaped by millennia of occupation and domestication. It's, no, and now I stay on the path and I don't like, I try to be careful, but so I, I sort of these things, uh, I wasn't familiar with that. I, that wasn't a part of my sort of uh, taxonomic system because it wasn't a species that I was familiar with. In the Amazon, um, I went to kind of get at a, at a very basic way of understanding nature or classifying vegetation. And that is what plants are valuable and what plants are considered as Brazilians would say, ugly, feio, sujo, dirty, or just without any sort of use. What is threatening? What is, what is what has no benefit in which 
when you classify it in that, then you rip it out, you cut it, you poison it, you do whatever. But if it gets in that category, then that's that, then that, then it does not exist anymore. Um, so how do we kind of understand these very, very basic um, categories? All right. So let's see if I can. The overview, um, I'll first sort of define settlers and non forest spaces. This is an odd, usually anthropologists have a group they work with that is not spread across a wide arc of deforestation, thousand miles long. But I'm trying to operationalize essentially here who the, well, I'm supposed to stay close, uh, <laughs> who these groups are um, and what these, these spaces are. These are not communities, these are non forest spaces, spaces defined by their absence or their, their transition and also my methods. And then uh, I'll, I'll explain the system of classification, uh, either positively as plant. And I, I may sometimes use plant as a general descriptor for all vegetation, but in these systems, plant is a valued type of vegetation. This should not be confused with mato, which is uh, kind of like weeds, but more complicated, as you'll see. Um, and I'll explain how that's related to four principles that um, I observed in different non-forest spaces. These could be smoldering fields just established along the frontier, established ranches, farms. But what I'm going to focus on is a space that has many benefits, and that's the cemetery, which I, I'll explain to you how I got to the cemetery and how that came out, turned out to be so, um, so useful and so informative in the methods section. But it basically provides a, a, a great context for, for understanding these other spaces. And then finally, I'll talk about this vegetation as settler colonial text, what it means to shape vegetation according to these principles, how that's read and understood by others. To give you a sense of where I'm working here, I work in the state of, of Acre in southwestern Amazon, Brazilian Amazon on the border of Peru and Bolivia. I work in this the most uh, modified or deforested part of the state. Uh, along the BR-317 highway, which now connects with the uh, with, with Peru, with the Interoceanic uh, the Interoceanic Highway. Um, if you've heard of Acre before, it's it's likely because of Chico Mendes and the rubber tapper movement, um, who are located right there around, were located around Chapuri or Chico Mendes, but the rubber tappers continue to inhabit those spaces. To give you an idea of who I'm talking about here, uh, these, this is just this, this image shows you spatially where the different main, the three main different group, settler groups that I work with uh, live ranchers, large scale ranchers, um, large scale ranchers, rubber tappers, and colonists. These groups are, are distinguished in terms of how much land they own, how much that they have deforested in general, and all are sort of shift the rubber tappers are. are Traditionally, they, they rely on the forest and are these models of use space conservation, but they're also, as you can see in the image, shifting to cattle raising to some extent. So when I talk about settlers, I'm including those, those three rural, rural groups as well as urban populations. Uh, if I'm going to define settlers, the way that I do that is uh, sort of people residing in or managing non-forest spaces, those places that are light green on this map. Um, they, they rely on non-forest spaces for their livelihoods, primarily for cattle uh, raising or small-scale agriculture. Uh, they vary in terms of their socioeconomic standing and amount of land from wealthy landowners with thousands of hectares uh, to small-scale agriculturalists. The majority, uh, but the majority of non-indigenous indigenous Amazonians live in cities. Um, and so I'm also including these cities as non-forest spaces. Um, and there's, there's a lot of connection between, you may get the impression that these two sort of worlds aren't connected, but they're very connected in, in many parts of Amazonia, especially where there, where there are roads like in Acre. Um, the, it's important also, Amazonia sort of brings to mind certain ideas of who lives there and what, the, what life is like. But um, the people that I'm talking about here as settlers, uh, rural and urban alike, they're, they're very much inserted into broader circuits of culture, media, economy. Many, the majority of them, if they do produce food, they're, they're producing it for the market. Um, and, or they're, they're usually reliant on that and some sort of combination of, 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 of urban wage labor. Um, and this includes the rubber tappers who I work with as well, who are quite uh, sort of more remote than the other groups. 
Uh, what they tend to have in common, again, is that they, they view nature and humans as separate to some extent compared to the, maybe the indigenous ontologies you've heard of in which there's, there's more of an integrated system. To the average settler, nature is something different from humans and it's something below humans. It's something to be used, but not something to be engaged with um, as, as maybe a Western environmentalist or an indigenous person might sort of understand the two. So these populations live in what I call these non-forest spaces, which is roughly around 20% of the Amazon, Brazilian Amazon at this point. The calculations for remote sense for, for non-forest spaces are interesting because they're they're made by taking uh, you know images from remote sensing satellites and they classify land according to these binaries, especially in the, in the deforestation monitoring, uh, a forest or non-forest. In these non-forest spaces, uh, they're they're discernible, they're different, they're 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 visible because of what are called human signatures, these clear edges, uniform densities, straight lines, crop rows, these sorts of things. Um, these, 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 these make it clear that this is a non-forest space, but also that it is an anthropogenic space. It's not a savanna, it's not a river, it's not a, that sort of thing that was natural. It's produced by humans. And we'll see how that kind of logic of a signature is important in how people in sort of write culture onto nature in these, uh, these contexts that I'm talking about along the frontier. So these non-forest spaces that I'm focusing on there, they're largely been produced in the last 50 years or so. Uh, the ones that are the anthropogenic non-forest spaces. So we have ranches, farms, uh, urban homes, businesses, basically everything that is, is not natural. Uh, veg forest or vegetation is what I'm focusing on here. And I will focus specifically on, as I said, the cemetery and I'll explain why. So first I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to the cemetery. That sounds weird. I mean, how I, how I, and get this how I started researching the cemetery. So I it was it was it was one very very hot day in in December in in August 2017. I was walking on this very long block, and I, it's, you can kind of see this rise in the hill. And it was I was sweating a lot, and then this big cloud sort of came into view. And it didn't often rain, so I wasn't prepared for the rain in, the, in, in August. And it started to rain, and I really. I was, I was trying to get out of the rain, but all there was was this huge wall here with a cemetery on the other side. And then on this side, uh, a bunch of houses with, with barbed wiring, broken glass, and not very welcoming places on the other side. So there was really nowhere even to like hide with, for there was an overhang. So I hurried up the block and I didn't even know where the entrance to the cemetery was, but I, I, I found a place, I went inside and I, I, I got, I had shelter for a brief period of time and I talked to the, to the um, to the supervisor and told her about my research and she told me oh you should talk to one of our caretakers or any of them but she recommended one particular name Joao and so I went and talked to Joao and it turned out to be a very very interesting and, and revealing experience for me and that's what I'm going to sort of use Joao and other experiences in the cemetery to kind of lay out these different these principles of settler colonial taxonomies there's Joao I assure you he's in, really enthused to talk to me. Um, here we are in the cemetery. Um, and uh, Joao walked around with me, told me that he has 70 plots. This is a huge municipal cemetery in the capital city of Rio Branco. Um, so there are, there are great, there are many plots. Joao is called a zelador de tumulo, meaning he's a grave care, caretaker. The cemetery is interesting because it's a public space, but people pay people like Joao individually to take care of their plots. So Joao is paid by 70 families each, each month to take care of, for example, maybe this one, maybe another one, maybe another one. But there's 12 people in the cemetery who take care of these different, different tombs and, and plots. So as we walked around the grounds, Joao told me about these plots, the metal urns and adornments that he polished, tiles that he had regrouted and reattached, the photos, artificial plants and surfaces that he cleaned with a damp cloth. He also swept away the mango leaves, trash and old candles, that made a plot look dirty or messy. Much of his work though, was dedicated to dealing with the living vegetation that was on the ground level plots. Uh, these had an outline of some sort uh, of some sort that was just a little bit larger than a casket. Um, and as they were on the ground, the plants were con con uh, constantly kind of trying to grow on them. Um, so on these, he would trim the flowers and the bushes that grew. 
he, and he pulled out the motto. That was, he said, his most important job. Um, and so after Joao showed me around, um, I asked him about the different plants that we that we had seen, with, and I was trying to understand basically this difference between mato and um, and plant. Um, and I pointed to a patch of ground cover, um, little pink flowers. And I'm not a botanist, and I often don't know the names of things, and I often don't even ask the people the names of them. I just I'm interested in sort of the categories, and I, and I only identified this, this this species after the fact by talking to other people in Joao. Joao knew it by a, 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 a local name, which I, I'll show you here in a moment. So, um, so I, I, I thought I, I, this is basically my method of talking to people, walking around, pointing to them uh, to different vegetation, asking them. Um, so I pointed to a patch of ground cover, pink, small pink flowers. That's a plant, he said. Joao was quick to respond with a precise categorization of the vegetation each time I pointed. Planta, mato, planta, mato. And Joao was very, very clear about it because his job depended on making these look good. And if any motto was on the, the, the grave, then people would not want him. He wouldn't be the best grave caretaker. He would not have achieved, he would have, have succeeded in his job. So after a while, I, I gained some confidence that I understood what Joao was doing. And I, and I, and I said, oh, I think I wrote it. I said, hey, Joao, look, it's that plant. And Joao said, no, that's motto. And I said, but it's the same plant, isn't it? The one with the little pink flowers. Joao said, no, that is not a plant. And I, what? But you said, but it's the same plant we saw over there. You said it was a plant. And Joao said, it is the same, but this one is not a plant. It's mato. So we continue this conversation with the, with the other principles in the future. But for now, I think we have to define sorry, what, is, uh, what, what is the basis for, for, for plant or mato. So I was, first of all, I was using the word planta there as a general descriptor for all vegetation, including mato. Um, I thought mato was a subcategory of plants, but Joao told me plants and mato are mutually exclusive, uh, different categories. Um, for the sake of consistency, then I'm, I, I refer to these as vegetation as sort of the overarching category with plants, plants, plants and mato. Um, so when I refer to individuals or specific types of vegetation, I'll use the term species um, only when actually the interviewees actually name them. This is because a given species, as we saw here, it could be mato or, or a plant, depending on the circumstances. Um, within the category of plants, individual types or species may be named by specialists, but more often they're implicitly just recognized as a part of, of, of being uh, this larger category of plants. Um, and mato, similarly, is people are, are pretty quick, the mato plant, sort of like Joao was doing, they can recognize these things quickly. Um, without actually knowing the names, unless, for example, like stinging nettle, it's particularly painful or harmful in some way. They don't really know the names of mato, what it is. It's just something to get rid of. So, um, uh, so plants in general are maybe crops. They may be other things considered useful, beautiful, or, in, or beautiful in some way, um, such as ground cover or, or turf or uh, shade fruit trees surrounding a home. And I created, I, I did consult with some agronomists and, and experts on plants in, in the state to understand what mato was. And uh, one agronomist said, it's a planta danina o invasora. So a damaging or an invasive plant with no utility, he added. Um, so to understand this definition of mato, you got to distinguish wild, the wild spaces from the non forest spaces claimed by humans. So mato is vegetation that's okay in the forest. It's okay in wild spaces uh, because those aren't claimed by humans. But when mato uh, comes into human spaces, it is seen as being invasive or damaging. Um, it essentially taints or dirties spaces claimed by humans, making them appear what's called mal cuidado, like badly taken care of or sujo, dirty. Um, spaces that were previously managed by people, but which have become overgrown or neglected or seen as, as being abandoned or returning to nature. It's people say, did that person move? Are they, are they sick? Are they dead? If, if, if plants start to grow without this sort of periodic shaping by, 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 by uh, caretaking, people begin to wonder. And then that's the sort of physical element, but there's also, are they becoming an environmentalist? What, are they choosing to do this? Either way, it's troubling in this settler colonial society. 
So mato is similar to the Portuguese term for weed, which is herba daninha, uh, damaging, which literally means damaging grass or herb. And the terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but Amazonian mato is not simply weeds. This becomes clear with the rest of the agronomist's definition. Mato consists of uncultivated plants of medium size, he said. It could also mean the regeneration of native vegetation. So there's two things here. First, mato is not big. It's not large in size. Um, it can be small. It can be, an, it can also be an aggregate unit, like a, on a vacant lot, that's mato. Or it can be this dandelion in this crack of the sidewalk, mato. It, it, mato, but it can't be big or else it becomes what's called mata, flor, forest. So the, mato is seen as being uh, smaller, but also the predecessor of the forest. And if mato is allowed to take hold, then the forest returns and essentially ruins all human possessions. First, it ruins your field, but then it ruins your house. Um, so it's like this scene as being, and I've seen this happen from going back, you know, every summer, you see a vibrant home hidden under 20, 15 foot trees, because uh, it does, the Amazonian vegetation is quite quick to, to uh, grow. Um, okay, so basically that first principle is that vegetation has these two main categories of planta and mato. And um, these are mutually exclusive and they're also ranked. That's important. They're not just categories, they're marked ranked categories. Mato is not good, plants are good. So categories aren't just abstract things with no, no meaning or value. These determine life or death in the plant world and in other, other senses as well. Okay, so let's, here's just some examples of this. This would be, all be mato. It's come into human spaces. And this is clearly abandoned and would be difficult to recuperate. This is at the edge of a park. Mato is the place where you throw trash and do things you don't want people to see also. People say, ah, joga no mato. Like, Throw it in the throw it in there in the mato because that's a non-human space. Or let's go there in the mato to do something bad or illicit or illegal because people don't, it's like people don't see that. And so mato also has this fear, people sort of fear the mato. Uh, what's what's actually what's lurking sort of there? Um, so this brings us to the, sort of that second point. When if we continue with the conversation with Joao said, what, but why? If it's the same thing, how can it be a plant there in Mato here? And Joao said, Por que eu não plantei? Ele viu sozinho, é Mato. And he said, because I didn't plant it, it came on its own, it's Mato. And I was like, oh, planting plants, I didn't ever, how did I not see that? Um, so yes, plants are planted. Um, mato, as Joao said, comes on its own. The name of the category is also the verb that describes the act of human placement in a specific location. Humans choose which plants to plant and, and the, the, based on what they provide them, um, that is useful, beautiful, not harmful. But given that motto is not seen as being useful, it's assumed that people would never choose to plant it. Um, thus, when motto is in human spaces, it must have come on its own um, or invaded. So the conversation with Joao shows that plants too can become mato. So it's not about species in this case, because this same species is in, a, I circled it. It's really hard to see. Um, so it depends on sort of, is it behaving as a plant should behave, which is completely as, as an extension of human desires, or is it behaving with an agency outside of humanity or human desires, and that makes it mato. So uh, the second principle then is that the classification depends on the origin of the vegetation or how it arrived or came to exist in a human space. If it was planted, it was a plant, and the same species or mato came on its own, it is mato. So the next year I was, I returned to Brazil and I went to this small town of Assis, Brazil on the border with, with Peru, with um, someone I had worked with on previous projects and I asked him if he could take me to the cemetery. And that was again, an awkward situation, but he, he, was, he said, yeah, sure, okay. So we went to the cemetery. And um, so what's interesting here is that he wasn't a caretaker, he wasn't invested. His job didn't depend on making these distinctions and carrying out you know, the management of these spaces. But he was Brazilian in the sense that he had this shared sort of cultural understanding of, 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 of plants. 
Um, so as we walked around the cemetery, and this one was smaller, right? You can see it's, it's much less built up. Um, my friend uh, showed me uh, the different, different tombs and that sort of thing. We saw this one plant. Sorry, one second. Um, right here. So the same plant, we saw the same plant in two places. And I asked him, I'm, his name is Gremio here. I said, uh, do you, I asked him if he knew what it was. He said he didn't know, but he said people planted it for good luck or protection for the deceased. Um, later, about two months ago, I wrote him and I said, what is it called? And he had to ask his dad and his uh, cordyline fruticosa or Thai plant. Um, he called it croth. But anyway, the name uh, isn't as important here, but adjacent to the plot, we saw that same one in a crack. So this one is closer to you right now. And I asked him um, if that, I basically said, look, it's that plant again. And he said, that's not a plant, that's mato. And I said, why? And he said, because it's ugly. And I said, why is it ugly? Like, it's the same plant. Like, and he said, no, it's not centered. It's not in the right place. It's, um, it shouldn't be there. And instead of bringing some sort of good thing to the person buried here, he felt that that was bringing, that was not performing that magical or beneficial function, but rather this was a bad, this was a reflection. If someone loved this person, they would pull it out and they would manage that plot and maybe plant something similar right in front, not on the plot. So as we saw sort of with, with principle one and two, humans choose these certain species designated as plants and they plant them. Planting then is this act of fixing that chosen vegetation into a location where it is wanted and where it will stay. And then this brings us to this third principle based on where the vegetation is located in these anthropogenic zones, its position. And this has two elements really, a zone, uh, zone and location. So location really is what Gremio is talking about here, where the vegetation is in relation to human constructions. It could be a home, a grave, plot. This could be a hedgerow, um, a flowering plant, something centered. It has to be in a position that is, doesn't block your view or make mangoes fall in your car all the time. It has to be somewhere that makes sense and looks good. Um, so this can be based on things like symmetry, balance, um, but also in relation to these sort of potential benefits and harms, such as privacy, good luck, magic, these sorts of things. Zone then refers to the different areas or subsections of a given anthropogenic space. Most grave plots only have one zone, uh, that which was in, which is within the outline of the plot. The average rural property, however, has several zones from the forest reserve to the pastures, the agricultural fields to maybe the Swidden plot in the middle of the forest. Um, and then what's called the Quintal or Tejero, where these, these little essentially yards surrounding a home, they're usually the big animals aren't allowed to come into. Um, and in each of these, there are different rules for what can be there and what shouldn't. And if, for example, the pasture goes into the the corn plot, that's a weed, you pull it out. If the corn goes into the, the, to, the, um, to the pasture, you might let it stay. I don't know, but, but in, people are strict in very, it depends on how strict people are. Um, the, the, and I have seen people let like feral or runaway plants grow in different places, but they tend to have a different sort of mentality and, and a deeper knowledge of plants. Because a lot of this is not really that explicit like reasoning, but just like there's a weed pull it out, hit it with a white machete, that sort of thing. Um, so in each zone, there's really these, these rules about which plants are allowed in that zone and what uh, and where they should be located. I think that I have an image here for this. So this is, this is a good one because you can kind of see um, the different zones. This, this is a unique Tejero, and then it has a, a yard that is a pasture grass, which to be beautiful and not sujo, it has to be low like this. And then the, the, the dirt is swept. And that's something I didn't understand also. It's like, how do you make dirt clean by sweeping it? And, but then it was like, well, it's not about the absence of dirt. It's about being in, things being in their place, things being, um, having this sort of relatively uniform appearance. So what's going on here is the loose dirt is being removed. In addition to the trash, all these other things that are considered out of place. In addition to things like leaves, which people fear, you know, if you have, if you start letting too much get accumulated, then snakes will hide or other things like that. So there's this, 
desire to have a good, uh, good visibility. Okay, so principle four, forms, uh, form. This is about the shape. Plants are taken care of by people. Okay, so um, the following year, uh, where, where was I? So Rob and I saw that same little pink flower, the vinca again, this time it was on the far edge of the plot. So it seemed out of position. I don't have a picture of this because like I said, this sort of developed, I didn't even think about principles. I thought it was like there are two categories and I took pictures of some things, but this, this didn't even cross my mind as being related. So we saw that same plant again. Um, it was out of place because it wasn't like centered on a plot, but it was perfectly centered between two different plots. They were adjacent to each other. So it appeared to be as if someone had planted it because it was so perfectly positioned. Perhaps maybe it was a boundary or a border. Chihuahua didn't know, uh, but he thought that it looked like someone had planted it. So he didn't rip it out because that would be against sort of the rules. Like if it's an unclear who's it, who's it who belongs to, you don't rip it out because plants are valued. Um, and he had, he had sort of taken over that plot after, after it had been planted. But since it was a plant, it sort of got the benefit of the doubt. If it was Mato, he would have ripped it out as a service to his neighbor. Um, so here, the plant's position on the edge made it difficult to know not only who it belonged to, but um, it, it sort of brought into, it highlighted these sort of social relations that occurred at the, at the cemetery as well. It also reveals kind of how these three principles worked together. The specific vegetation, vegetation survived because it was the right type. It was a plant, it was a motto. And it was a position in a place that appeared intentional. It was located in the right position. And so it was, because of these attributes, it was assumed that it couldn't have happened naturally, that it had been planted because plants are planted. Well, it makes sense to me now. Uh, for Joao, it came down to something else when I asked him if it was plant or motto. Uh, I, he said it was a plant because we, we take care of it. Um, I could see that the plant looked like a decorative flower, flower plant should. It has sort of a balanced uh, outline, rounded perimeter. Uh, it was, so being in the right shape or form for Joao, it, that, or for anyone, that doesn't happen naturally. This sort of natural beauty that is appreciated in nature is the product of human management and cultivation. So thinking, for example, in a Japanese garden, for example, or an English garden, for example. Um, so... The an, unplant, an unkempt plant wouldn't become mato though. That's this is the difference here, but it would become ugly and dirty and basically have the same negative implication for, for example, the person living with some misshapen plants in front of that, like an overgrown hedgerow in England. And it's really interesting. I like England's turned out to be really interesting for this because you have shared hedgerows across these big apartments, and like one neighbor is perfect and one is the and you wonder sort of like do people read this as indicative of something um, in the same way as they do in the Amazon? So uh, that's the fourth element there is, is the form. Um, here you can see an ice topiary bush, for example, in the city of Rio Branco. And this is um, a pasture in the rubber tapper reserve, uh, which I'll just kind of have up here uh, as I, as I Think about this next element of vegetation is a settler colonial text. So, so far I've talked about these observable features of plants being the basis for categorization. These features are related to the actions of people who care for them or claim these anthropogenic spaces. They choose, they plant, they position, and they shape the plants. They may do these things because it brings them pleasure or profit in the form of crops or beautiful landscapes. Um, but they're also very, they're keenly aware that these landscapes are viewed and evaluated by society. This becomes more apparent with this fourth principle and the focus on form and shape of the vegetation. The scraggly plant, the overgrown hedgerow or patchy lawn tells us, tells others uh, that the care has not, uh, the caretaker hasn't done what's necessary to create that beautiful vegetative cover. That unkempt lawn, for example, may be interpreted as a troubling sign of the people who live there. Um, and, but in order to understand this, we can't focus on immediate relations between humans and plants. We have to think more broadly about this broader social settler colonial context. And a good place to kind of 
understand this because it's been the focus of previous research as well as the United States. Uh, ecologist and American environmentalist Aldo Leopold, Leopold once wrote, the landscape of any farm is the owner's portrait of himself. Michael Pollan also wrote about growing up in post-war America and his dad's obsession with the lawn, his lawn as being indicative of the families and upstanding, uh, uh, upstanding good citizens. But unlike the, we can assume, productive landscape of Leopold's farm, the benefits of the American lawn are less materially obvious. American homeowners also report frustrations with the cost of environmental impacts of lawns, which are one of the, one of the United States' largest cover crops. Um, but many feel sort of pressured with the, shamed into creating, continuing sort of to create and work on these lawns and make them perfect. So in these North American examples, we can see uh, a similar dynamic uh, that, that is expressed in Acre, where people are, the landscapes we create are assumed to reflect values to some extent. Um, in Acre, I've kind of, I'll sort of skip over, but it's basically applies the same in Acre. The cemetery is interesting because there's no living person claiming that space. So really, why does it, why is there, why is there so many people dedicated to clean, making these spaces beautiful. And I think that's what one of those things that makes the cemetery so revealing because you can kind of see um, uh, this different element of, of how landscapes are reflective of broader, uh, uh, or embedded in these broader social collectives. In this case, people don't go to the cemetery to look at, to sort of look at other, other plots and compare and evaluate them, but they nonetheless see them. And they're read in two ways. One is that there's a name on there and people know the name and they relate it to living people. And they assume, is this person fulfilling their familial duties to the deceased? Are they good? Are they good people basically, or are they not? And they may not be doing that, but they're paying Joao to do that. So they appear to be good. Uh, very few people actually take care of the plots. Um, and then secondly, they're read in terms of, are these beautiful, are these clean? Because that would show that, you know, the, the people are, it would give the impression that the people are taking care of it like they are their lawn or their garden, that sort of thing. Um, so the cemetery, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to kind of think about how these categories of uh, uh, guiding how vegetation is shaped, they really show how settler colonialism express on this land. And I'm using settler colonialism here, but I mean sort of a domineering anthropocentric way of expressing oneself. It's obvious in the Amazonian frontier it's easy to sort of equate it with settler colonialism, but it exists in places that aren't actively sites of colonization and settlement. Um, so from this settler perspective, settlement of the tropical forest can really only happen through this, the disciplined labors of human actors who agree with this broader mission of development. These clean anthropogenic spaces are understood to be the product of cultivator to culture subjects in a, in a number of ways, meaning that they're part of a culture as in a shared collective with similar beliefs and values. But literally, it's also the application of culture to the land, cultivation, producing these cultivated landscapes that if you look at these remote sensing images, it's clear there's a patterned way of shaping the land. There's a similar way of using the land. And it's not all sort of economically explicable. Um, but, it, but it is, people have sort of a template in mind when they go. And it's basically get rid of everything that's, our, that's here right now and replace it with something I know to be useful or productive. So um, this landscape, uh, we'll start, settlers also see them sort of as culture to cultivate in the third way, which is that they are bringing development. They are a higher form of humans compared to those that they are displacing. Sort of they are proving themselves through their labors to sort of to rise above sort of what they would consider. People often say that take the state out of the stone age, as they'll say, or out of primitive states. We're bringing progress, development, modernity is how, how settlers and colonists talk about this. Um, so, uh, really, I've talked about how vegetation is shaped, but now it's about sort of how it's read and this inscription, really, this writing of settler colonialism. How do we sort of confront that um, in the Amazon? But I also, you know, as I write this paper, I think about the cemeteries in California. They're, they may they look like they 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 look like a carpet, you know, like they're so perfect. Everything is so perfect and frozen and and and. And I'm not, you know, we're not sort of battling the frontier in California. So these, this, this sort of mentality 
this way of thinking about the world and the need to control it and the, the way we control it says something about us and who we are as good citizens is something that is really important to sort of consider in, in this broader process of decolonizing. And it's not just in the Amazon, in the frontier, it's every, I mean, where I'm from, but I'm sort of witnessing here in England as well. Um, because as I've said repeatedly, this isn't, it's like my lawn is not a crop. It doesn't benefit really many people at all. Um, but there's that pressure there. And how do we sort of overcome that um, uh, by, by sort of questioning our own categories? Um, so I love it. Let's see how much time I have. Yeah. I, so I think it's been 50 minutes. I mean, I'm, I can go ahead and let me see. Oh, well, there's also more, a clear way of sort of writing on the landscape uh, that's more explicit. So like, if it didn't have Bolsonaro written on the landscape, it would already kind of be apparent because there is some sort of assumed connection between these sort of clean landscapes and these, this desire for a clean, orderly society. Um, and if you are interested in this, it actually turns works out well because essentially part two of this is where I take that topiary bush and relate it to the body. And I'm presenting on that next week because I think that this is not just about nature as being out there, but also nature on the body. Things that grow that we can't control and how we, the way we control them is supposedly said something about us. And if we don't do that, we're sort of evaluating this in some way. So I wanted to, if you wanted to see that next level of this, you can uh, check this presentation out on next week. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. It was really, really interesting. Um, the perspective that you bring to the study of deforestation. Um, uh, I think there are so many things to just comment on on your presentation. I I worked in and I lived in just across the bridge from Assis in uh, Madre de Dios in Peru. So I'm acquainted with at least the Peruvian side. I've of course gone to Brazil sometimes, and it's, uh, you can see the differences and so forth, which is interesting in itself. Um, I guess a question I had. Um, relates to the, the title in your presentation. It sounded to me like a play on Jim Scott's uh, seeing like a state. Um, and I was just wondering if you had that in mind. Uh, if basically you had something related to like broader implications for our like theories around the state or government, um, which is wondering if, if that was something that you also uh, were planning on conveying with this research. Yeah, that was originally the uh, kind of the inspiration, I think. But then it became a he's referring to seeing like a state and the idea of legibility and sort of writing, um, this sort of legit, well, making order and progress essentially in Brazil, writing that onto the landscape, which is especially a challenge. Amazonia presents sort of a threat, to this sort of rigid planning. Um, but yeah, it, it's. It was related to that, but also Eduardo Cohn's seeing like uh, how forests think. It was kind of initially supposed to be sort of combining those and, and trying to also, it wasn't going to be, with, with Cohn, it was like, well, let's bring in some of the, the way that these migrants or settlers and non-indigenous people see the forest um, and how they understand it. And it was, but it, I never could completely work out the connection of the scales and that sort of thing. Um, but I think that at some point I want to return to, to that, try to do that framing of it. But uh, that's a good, it's good that you noticed that. And there's also Seeing Like a Native by Levy Brule, which is another one that I wanted to bring in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically just, I'm using it now in terms of like in a basic way, how do, when people get to the frontier, when they look out on their, their front porch in the morning, how do they see things and how does that, how do they then act on those things? 
Okay, great. There's a question online by Jordan. Jordan, do you want to unmute and switch on your video and ask directly? Otherwise, I can relay it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, Hi, Dr. Hull. Thank you for um, the great talk. Um, I've actually been meaning to get in touch with you because uh, I've started a PhD recently on the role of cattle culture in advancing deforestation. Um, and your work has really been informing what I've been doing. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to repeat what I said in the chat, basically. So since the initial work that you published around a decade ago, how has this cattle ranching mindset um, in Amazonia changed and evolved? And how do you think the election of Bolsonaro has contributed to the shift in your opinion? Thank you, Jordan. Uh, oh, you're there. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh hi. Um, or you don't, you, hi. <laughs> but thank you very much. And I hope you do get in touch. It'd be great to talk to you more about this. Um, with, this is basically me building on the cattle culture, which is Jordan's referring to my first book, uh, Rainforest Cowboys, which was trying to understand the logic of cattle raising in the Amazon. And a big part of that was about people talking about these pastures and what they meant. And that's kind of how this began. And then um, wanting to understand these aesthetic or not purely economic dimensions of landscape transformation. And seeing that it, the, what was going on with cattle was 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 not just about cattle. It was because the, the other, you know, think about soy farms and and other things. They're definitely sort of obeying the same anthropocentric uh, sort of logic in terms of how they they shaping the landscape. And so it's it's kind of an attempt to go broader uh, in Amazonia, but also I I do plan in this book that I'm working on to to relate it to other contexts like where I'm from, where in perhaps being in England for a year will help me bring that in as well, because I think it, and especially when I talk um, next week about the body, I think this is something, an issue that we're all sort of facing of how do we connect um, environmental justice with the social justice in a way that's, that this meaningfully engages that conceptual system where people are sort of judged based on the way they control these things that grow and that we can't control. Um, but Jordan, um, if you do write me, I'll, I'll send you a link because the, the book just came out in Portuguese last week. And there's going to be something in the, the Folia de Sao Paulo next week, I believe, where they're basically asking me, like, what's changed? But basically in that book, I was very careful because everyone knew Acre is the land of Chico Mendes and, and it's a place where you would go to do research to kind of talk about things didn't have to be destructive and Amazonian development could be kind of more harmonious. But at the same time, cattle ranching was expanding. So in that book, I kind of was very careful and didn't... Uh, <laughs> Because I was, I was still sort of unsure, am I really seeing this happening because no one ever talks about it? But I think since then it's become really way more obvious. Um, and so I've been surprised that, that, that it has changed so much. And um, yeah, so anyway, Jordan, thanks and I'll look forward to talking to you. Perfect, thank you. Hi. Um... Just you know, listening to your talk, and you're talking about sort of human endeavor, it seems to be quite sort of key in this is that plants are the result of human endeavor um, and plants from their place and they are cared for and tended by people. Um, which, and it's just a connection that happened in my mind. And I just wonder if it was something that you came across as you talked to people around the subject, was whether there's a sort of, I guess, religion, an element of religion in this, in the, you know, certainly within Christianity, that man is set up in dominion over the world, over nature, over the planet, that, um, and there was just, there was just this sort of, this was kind of resonating in my mind, you know, human endeavor, human domination, human control. It felt like that maybe there might be. No, certainly, I think the religious element is important and people would talk to me about that, this sort of virtue of work and how that was a part of their sort of proof of dedication to their religion. Um, and, 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 and similarly being slovenly or not, not being a hard worker and the, how that was reflected in the landscape that you produced. Um, but yeah, in Genesis, it's all sort of clear about binaries of light and dark and that sort of thing, but also humans are here and everything else is to be used 
and that's part of your sort of, you know, your duty essentially. Um, and that was quite strong with some people in, in, in there that were religious, but it was, but it, I mean, that religious, those religious elements are built into institutions where, you know, improvement, if you improve your land, it means you cut it all down and you put something clearly cultivated on it. And that increases the, the value of that land. It becomes land. It's not land before that. It's only land when you cut it down and can use it. Um, and then you have more of a basis for a land claim. And so these ideas, they're, they're in religion, they're in, they're in, they're in laws, and they're, they're, they're just really widespread. And so I, that's the thing about Acre is, is they were at least, they were trying to sort of take all this on and, and value the forest. But it was like, how do you do that? There's so much sort of baggage and weight and machinery behind this other way of seeing the world and engaging it. And so uh, the, it's quite complicated, but you're right. It's, it's, it's related to religion, one, one, one part of it for sure. I'll take a second one online. Uh, Kasia, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Edwinder. Um, thank you very much for, for, for the talk. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, and I had a question uh, kind of coming from two perspectives. So when I was doing work uh, around the Trans-Amazon Highway for my PhD, I drilled into like nature connection and, and attitudes uh, to nature, but mostly around animals. It hasn't really occurred to me to think about, uh, about plants. Um, but more recently, I've been working on um, perceptions of, uh, well, rewilding, but also farming spaces in, in the UK. Um, and what you find that, yeah, I found one, I found attitudes towards uh, different aspects of, of nature to, to vary within the Trans-Amazonian uh, um, within the trans -Amazonian landscapes among, among the um, farmers. And I also found that um, you know, in, in the UK and other European landscapes, you find that, um, yeah, the kind of old paradigm is very much in line with what you described, that um, people try and control nature, and if a plant occurs out of space, it's a weed. Um, but that's not the only kind of attitude and perception you find. So I was wondering to what extent um, you find the this paradigm to be completely generalizable um, and to what extent you find sort of some deviations from it in Acre? Sure, um, that's a good question. And it's something I struggle with, you know, I'm trying to explain 20% of the Amazon and all the people who live there. It's, it, it's, it's a little bit too much, I think. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's like, we have to try to theorize these threats and these structures in a way that's, that, that is meaningful. And, um, and so that's essentially what this is, is the first step of like, what are the basic rules that most people agree to? But there is variation. And I think that um, I will, in, in, the, in the broader project, I'll bring that out. But I think another thing to realize though about Acre, and you've been in the Amazon as well, is a lot of these people didn't come from there. It's, it's it, the, the, the plants and the trees and the forest and the mosquitoes and the, the jaguars scare them. They, they, they want, they, they don't understand like, oh, this could give rubber or this is a fruit I could eat or this would attract. They don't have this deep ecological knowledge. And so for them, it's a sort of first step is to clear that space and at least be able to see what's going on and for a huge tree to not fall on you and, and to take care of your, your sort of secure yourself in that space. But with time, you begin to see people recognizing, learning also, like there's these, these lines between groups are relatively uh, porous. And like rubber tappers are teaching colonists, for example, like, no, you can use this or, or for, for, especially for medicinal purposes. Colonists are sort of acquiring that knowledge and learning to identify. And they've also learned from experience. I'm, my house is too hot because I have no trees because I cut everything down. Or, um, you know, so there's this give and take. And I think I'm sort of describing that, 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 that first stage of frontier occupation, but there is a great deal of variation. Um, and there, but there's also, for example, extension agents doing sistemas agroforestais, uh, agroforestry systems. And they report, you know, they're trying to get people to plant trees and like leave the leaves on the ground. And people are like, no, that's so dirty. Why would I, you know, and it, but it's not just like dirty. It's like, there's gonna be snakes under there or, you know, they're like, they have real concerns. And they've, they've known people who've gotten bitten by snakes or jaguars that have hit 
behind a tree that they didn't cut or you know that sort of thing and so they there's there's a great deal of variation but i think it is changing and i think that is a key um long term is is to kind of learn how to to change and combat these attitudes but it's interesting you've said you've seen it like here that's surprising um but it, it's also that comparative perspective is interesting because i imagine being a brazilian here and like it, there's this natural aesthetic that in amazonia i think people would be like think that's that's quite sujo that's sort of uh what do you call it scruffy like the, the plants are allowed to sign of not they don't have to be totally geometric but people are sort of comfortable with that element but there's still there's some element of control thank you though for your question thanks so much thank you and erica Hey Jeff, thank you for your talk. Um, I struggle a bit though between the title and the content. Um, Rio Branco is a city of 410,000 people and you spoke to a few grave diggers or grave keepers to be more fair, like Zelador de Tumulo. So how do you re relate that to the actual people on the forefront of the agricultural expansion and their mindset? Yeah. which is driven by commodities. So it seemed to me quite it, it, a disparity there, especially because when you are in Amazonian big city, most people have never been to the forest, actually. They just grew up in the city. They come from a generation of people that might have migrated there from other areas, as you well said, through to Inca settlements in the 70s. But they are first or second generation city-born people that never been to the forest. So isn't that quite a bit of extrapolation from graveyards to deforestation across the Amazon, which in three years lost an air to South of Belgium? Isn't that a bit of an extrapolation? I, uh, it is. Um, it, I, I didn't totally explain sort of why I was linking those and why I was focusing on the forest, but it is, I, I don't wish to sort of defend, like this is a huge area, a lot of people, a lot of variation. Um, but the thing about the, the 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 cemeteries and it wasn't a handful of grave diggers or it was it was quite, it was a lot of interviews with people urban planners and for people who enforce who give fines for letting your vegetation grow too long people who's merchants at a place called casa do veneno the house of poison i guess like where they sell agro talks and um so it, it's a it's a much bigger project than i sort of chose to focus on the principles of it because I think that those, what I was able to see in these small spaces of the cemetery was reflective of what would be more difficult to talk about on a rural property, especially when it's 5,000 hectares, but is roughly guided in terms of the management. And I think that's a distinction. A lot of this is more about the management than about that, that first stroke of deforestation, but it's about how do you sort of defend that with these categories? How do you defend human anthropogenic space um, because the categories were roughly consistent um, across these spaces. Um, it was just a matter of determining what, what is it that determines that this plant can be in this space? Is it, is it that it's a species or that it's, it can be, uh, it's, its position is what matters or its benefits, that sort of thing. So it was the rural mapping was the more involved mapping where I would work with rubber tappers, colonists and ranchers and I walk around the properties and, and we would talk about everything in those spaces. Um, but I, I, I appreciate you sort of pushing me on that because I need to, you know, either abandon trying to be so broad or I need to be more clear so I see how broad I can sort of be. Because, I mean, I think you also know, like just this distinction between mato and, and, and plant is a big deal. And, and it's not it, that which is thought of in the city by people who've never been to the forest is quite similar to the people who are shaping the frontier um, who came from cities or came from uh, southern Brazil and that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, I suggest you move here so people can still see you on camera. You can uh, uh, move where? To back to the podium. Oh, okay. So I've been looking up there for no reason. They can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I was maintaining eye oh, okay. oh, contact. Uh, there's a call from Connie online. Connie, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Jeff, um, for a very interesting, provocative talk. I think my my question is also, and sort of comment is also around contextualizing this. 
Because I do think, as you say, there's a bit of a risk um, in sort of assuming this uniformity of not only the uniformity of, of perspectives, but also uniformity of why and what it means for people. Um, so I think if I'm understanding it correctly, there's this idea that um, this, that this perspective is, is wrong. Um, but then it raises the question of, well, who gets to decide how people should look at nature, how they should relate to it. Um, I think I like the way you talked about um, ways and, you know, sort of the realities that, uh, for example, farmers might be facing on the frontier and how that might shape their views of, of you know, nature and, and being good neighbors, et cetera. But I think the more of that kind of context you can bring in, the sort of more, more meaning this starts to take on. Um, because, uh, you know, poisonous snakes, for example, are, are gonna be uh, something I think any one of us would be concerned about if we were actually living and trying to make a living off of the Amazonian frontier. So I think, especially in thinking about how to engage with the perspectives of people on the frontier, for example, it might we might get farther if we try to also hear more of their story um, of uh, you know what in fact what they know about nat nature, what however we define that, which might be a lot more than many of us do, because they've been you know sort of living and and confronting in it in it whatever we're calling it, I mean, that's another problem of <laughs> how we define nature um, than, than those of us in the city. But I just, it just worries me a little bit and maybe maybe I was not hearing it correctly, this sort of idea that that this is, they have a wrong attitude. I mean, I, I, as opposed to a particular attitude where we might wanna find some kind of common ground. And in order to do that, we need to contextualize both of our attitudes uh, or, you know, contextualize different perspectives on um, what plants are valued or what shape they should take, et cetera. So yeah, it's a few thoughts there. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. That was it's a difficult, it's a good question. It's, it's difficult to answer, honestly. And I think that's that's good. I'm glad that you sort of pushed me on that because this talk, now I'm realizing it was kind of because I'm giving you this a talk to the Center for Tropical Forests and, um, and I assume that there is an understanding of what is a desirable environmental future, um, and that doesn't include deforestation. And so I was thinking, how you know what what sort of information might be useful in terms of thinking about how to combat this thing that everyone just agreed should end in the next you know in in the recent future in the very near future. And so I think that there are certainly multiple ways of of thinking about nature um, and especially deforestation, that's something everyone is very comfortable vilifying. And a lot of my broader work is on just trying to understand and humanize gold miners, ranchers, people who really don't, aren't really, you never hear their stories. But that is, so that's the fundamentally anthropological component of it, but it's also the split sort of personality I have of like, well, how can I make this useful uh, for environmental, the, the environmental causes and, and beliefs that I also care about. Um, and so I think that there is uh, certainly a specificity, a, a particularity to the, well, no, I mean, I suppose while I'm focusing on them in, in the Amazon and, and I am, I'm not, I'm not meaning to like disrespect the way they think about nature. I, I think one of the reasons I focus on this is for one, I work there, but also because I see resonances of what th they're thinking in other places where it's less pronounced, where the forest isn't right there and you're attempting to establish a living and carve out an existence. Um, but it, it is much more clear there. And so I think that is a good sort of question. And that's in the actual paper that I wrote at the end of it, it's like, you know, we can, these extension agents can go out and talk about these more, these less uh, sort of domineering uh, ways of using the land, these ways that aren't as, is, is related to settler colonialism and anthropocentrism. But they also, the first step is not just to have like, hey, you don't, you can do permaculture, you can do agroforestry. It's like, well, where are you coming from, right? Like that is a real concern about snakes. You know, that is, your, your concerns are founded 
uh, to what extent uh, is there a shift that's possible um, that doesn't put you at danger, but which can eventually help you stay on this land longer? Because if you raise cattle, you're going to exhaust your soil in a decade or two at most, and you're going to move to the city. And that's what's been happening. And so there's an effort to kind of secure people in the landscape by creating these more diversified systems that fulfill ideally some environmental function and also allow people to stay there and not uh, move on. And then that land gets bought by a rancher who has the money to do rotation and all these other technologies and keep that land. And so, Connie, I think we need to talk about it more because I, I am I am I'm conflicted. And I think I, if I was watching this presentation, my main thing would be like, geez, you're really reaching with this. A lot, like there's a lot of space you're covering, a lot of people you're covering. Um, but the, that question of like, I don't want, I don't want to come across as, as, as vilifying. How do you, uh, how do we uh, humanize the people? But within the context that we recognize that things have to change in the world, um, and the world just agreed that this activity that is occurring is one of those things that is really crucial. So let's talk some more, Connie. I'll think about it. And you all too, I hope we can talk more at the uh, pub after this. Thanks. Uh, my name's Tom. I guess uh, fantastic talk, Scott Roo churning over through my mind experiences in everywhere from my own garden to the other side of the world <laughs> of sort of these perceptions. Um, at the start, you asked us to sort of separate in our minds sort of economic drivers and cultural ones. And I guess my question is a bit related to Connie's is listening to what you were describing. I was thinking that a lot of the things you were talking about actually could be traced back. They, they appear cultural, but actually can be traced back to oh, practical, either purely economic or safety related drivers. And I wondered if you, um, is, is, is that a reasonable conclusion that, that most of this stuff is actually, you know, these are, these are cultural rules of thumb that enable you to improve your economic and practical I, outcomes. That's a, that's a big question that I'm trying to get at with, with, with this project, with the way people manage the landscape, but also the body, like to what extent does this, does do these practices make sense or did they make sense in the past? And to what extent are they vestiges of, of, of practices that we don't do anymore? To what extent are they vestiges of perhaps a religious ideology um, or patriarchy or other sorts of um, systems that, that makes things seem natural or, or, or normal, or we're sort of brought up being like, don't touch this or that, or that sort of thing. And so I don't know the nature of, people can explain sometimes why, you know, they, they, this practice makes sense in an agricultural system. People are good about that, but the weeds, the motto is usually not something people try to understand. It's this system works well if I get rid of that element. Um, and it doesn't, and there's not really a questioning of, of how that might work. But I think that that is important to sort of distill or tr attempt to get at, you know, what, what, are the, what are the reasons for this? And I think that that's, eventually the solution is not just like sort of decolonized thought on everything, but like figure out where those lines are of what makes sense and what doesn't in, in how we manage the world uh, through in, engaging with that world and, and learning more about like what is actually useful and what is unnecessary or where there's a trade-off of like, it's kind of good and kind of bad, but it does this thing that I, that I think is beneficial for me or the broader world. Um, but I think that's another, another really big, important question to think about. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was curious the whole time, um, kind of thinking about Cronin's trouble with wilderness. Um, mm -hmm. This felt like very parallel to me for that, for that, I don't know, mm -hmm. perfect sentence. Um, but rather, I was wondering how you saw those two theories like talking to each other, that conception of wilderness versus the conception of Mako. 
um, like that was new for me. And I was wondering if you felt like they were similar or if you felt um, like these were two very different things. Um, you talked about like the, the Catholicism and stuff like that, which Cronin talks about a lot in his writing. So just kind of curious about your what, what is it specifically? Like, what is well, he kind of talks wilderness. about wilderness as like the, this frontier movement, something to be conquered. Um, it's it seems very similar to Mato and, and um, it coming stemming from a religious background and is specifically within a U.S. context. Um, and yeah, I, was, I didn't know if you read that or, or thought about that. I mean, some of Corona works really. I mean, like the way he talks about, for example, the first colonists and changes in the land and like every, it's a birch. Oh, look, a birch, another birch, a birch, a birch, because they don't have a vocabulary. So you're sort of explaining this biodiversity. Um, but I, what you're what you're asking about is it's interesting because there is this very much a sense in in Brazil, uh, especially in, during the time of the colonization and settlement of the Amazon in the seventies of like we like like Frederick Jackson Turner we're going to win the wilderness, it's going to be this it's going to propel us to great heights and it's going to be kind of the raw material for our our, our sort of joining the world powers, um, and this. The, 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 I, I would need to do like sort of a content analysis on the discourse of the time and how that's changed because my sense is that like people in the Amazon don't want to save the Mata, which is the big, is the forest, but they want to save the forest. So like, they'll be like, are you here? They'll often ask me, and I, I've never noticed it before, but like, are you here for the forest, the floresta? Because that's like a, that's like a forest that's good. But the Mata is like, it's, it's that thing that's on your land that you can't do anything with where it's that thing to be conquered in, the, in that sense of Cronin. And so there's this, it's almost like there's these two things existing in the same space that are the same thing, this floresta to be saved and this mata to be conquered and used and transformed. Um, and there's a real sort of struggle in terms of how people conceptualize those, but uh, people don't talk about sort of winning the frontier in Brazil as much anymore, just because they know it's like very NPC, uh, even the ranchers who are super, sort of nationalistic and talking about this as, a, as, as part of their sort of extension of their pioneer identity. You don't talk like that anymore. They talk more about sort of social justice for us, you know, <laughs> make, make, the, make the rules even on the international playing field and that sort of thing, rather than our right to this, the, this, this, uh, the forest. But that's a good question that Cronin is certainly very influential in my work. It strikes me uh, a point Kasia made that this, there are some analogies with the way the word weed is used in English as mm -hmm. well, that, uh, uh, and particularly this idea of self-willed nature that ruins the tidy landscapes that people choose to make. And, and I think you know, within the, both in the rewilding movement more generally, even lockdown, I think there's been more cultural right. acceptance of weeds. We talked a bit about how roadside verges now are it's seen as a positive that they're messy and untidy, even though I think to, to many people they're still ugly and a, a sign that people aren't looking after their roads or their urban habitats very well. So, so I think some of these parallels of letting uh, unwill, self-willed nature uh, against uh, human desires uh, is, is what defines a weed, essentially. There's lots of very valuable services weeds provide, but mentally they're, they're, they're placed in a different category from other plants uh, right. for that reason. There's a little bit like that, consider Martin. Uh, One format, just, yeah, just, just to riff off that, there's, um, there's quite a trend now for these sort of ver roadside verges and things that are left uh, wild to have a little sign saying, this has been, uh, this has been actively left wild, uh, to, uh, right. and there, thereby making it managed and safe. Right. And no, okay. it's, it's the same in California, where if you're going to let your lawn die, you, instead of letting it be red, that whatever it's you're faulting some virtue, people put a sign being like, I'm doing this because I'm good, because yeah, I'm not using water. Like yeah. Painting your fence post so, so mm -hmm. this is still deliberately managed. Yeah. So it's people recognize this way of sort of reading and they're and they're actively trying to sort of change that. I think that's that's the sort of good sort of thing that, that can occur. And I think this is also I've talked about like how to, you know, deforestation attempts to control that, but I think in restoration. 
it's, it's the same sort of thing Connie was talking about. Like, how do you meet people where they are and work with them and understand, okay, you have a, a concern that is real, right? Like it, perhaps with a, a, some sort of element of the landscape that is, is harmful or, 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 or maybe, you know, how do we sort of meet people where they are and then create these landscapes? There's a, a landscape ecologist in the US, Joan Nasur, who talks about how restored areas and nature preserves have a, a much greater uh, chance of success if you create like clean edges to them, right? Like uh, mow the, just mow the path and then people know it's not totally wild. Then they know it's a wild place they can go to because otherwise it might be like going into that vacant lot, you know, in the picture. No more questions. I think uh, I thank you, Jeff, for a round thank of applause. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for the people who joined online thank you. and, uh, uh, and have helped us through our teething problems with this first hybrid seven up that uh, I think it took well. So uh, thank you, everyone, online. And then the recording will be put on YouTube. Uh, uh, later uh, this uh, weekend. Bye-bye. Okay,